I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 13. We've been looking at uh, this parable of the wheat and the tares uh, in the progression of the study. Of course, we've gone through chapter 12 and now into chapter 13. And 13 begins the uh, beginning of the parables that Jesus is speaking. And evidently, this is the first time he's been speaking in parables. And it all starts in this chapter. And of course, the disciples are asking him why he's doing that, and he gives answers for that. And then he starts in, and this chapter contains the parables of the kingdom. So all of the parables except the very first one address the issue of the kingdom of heaven uh, and say the kingdom of heaven is like, which is a phenomenal uh, concept. So he's giving an expansion, an expansion view of what the kingdom is. So if you're interested in this merger between you and Jesus, and in that merger, the formation of something brand new called the kingdom of heaven, that's what he's talking about in the passage. And as you move into that, he gives this parable in verse 30 or verse 18, chapter 13, verse 18. He gives this parable. And for you, though, of, for you uh, have it, who haven't been a part of this study and may not be familiar with the parable of the sower, uh, I'll just refresh your m memory that uh, one has come along, the good, uh, the owner of the field has sown good seed and it's wheat. And then he says in the parable, a wicked one comes in verse uh, eight, 19 and snatches away, I'm sorry, we're, uh, it's over in verse uh, 24. In verse 24, he starts this parable and says, that's the parable of the sower, this is the parable of the wheat and the tares. So he says in verse 24 that a good man uh, who is on, you know, the owner of the field has sowed good seed. But verse 25, while, I'm, while the men slept, his enemy came and sowed good tears among the wheat and went his way. And when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. Now the servants came to the owner and said, Sir, did we not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? And he said, No. Lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares, bind them into bundles to burn them, and gather the wheat into my barn. Now there's very little wiggle room in the parable itself to get confused because he gives his own explanation for it, which is verse 37, as he begins in verse 37. He tells us distinctly that the man who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man, which would be Jesus. The field is the world, not the church, it's the world. The sons, the good seed, are the sons of the kingdom. Get this, because this is what we're going to talk about tonight. The good seed are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. Uh, we gave you a description of the tear, which really is essential in understanding the parable itself. Because no illustration, especially parables, stand on all four. In other words, you can't push every detail to its extent. He's telling a story. And within that story is this phenomenal truth. And his crowd would have understood exactly what a tear is. A tear is a wheat that has become bad in its growth process. So he says in the parable, in the story that an enemy has come in at night and sold the tares, as if they were something separate. But the crowd understood this was a story, and they understood what he was saying. And they understood that the wheat is planted, and somehow in the growth process, the wheat becomes twisted in its nature and in its character and becomes poisonous. So the tear is actually starting as a wheat, good in its, in, in its intent, and adds... Uh, ends up becoming poisonous in the nature of its own being, in the growth process. That's really important. Now, as you move into what we want to talk about tonight, and we started this a couple Saturdays ago, we've been giving you an outline. And we've talked about the, the tears, uh, the start, and we gave you three studies on that which was giving you the content, or the context, rather, of this whole thing. 
so that you could see the perimeters within which he's making this discussion. Now we're moving into the content itself, which is going to take us a little deeper into the thought process of what he's trying to say to us. And in this, this deeper view, the whole idea of sons appears. It appears that the heart of the concept that he's trying to get through to us is that God wants sons, that the wheat are sons of the kingdom. That God is not just planting like he'd plant a flower for the beauty of it. God is not just, not wanting just the aroma of the plant. God is not trying to feed himself. God is desperate, desperate, desperate for sons. In fact, it's interesting, we discovered that the word seed there is literally the word sperma, where we get our word sperm, which is the seed of life itself. So God is into the fathering, birthing process. And a couple Saturdays ago, we spent a study on the birthing idea, which all comes out of the seed idea. And the question that needs to be asked in relationship to the birthing idea is, who is your father? Which becomes the issue of the passage. And you only have two possibilities, obviously. And oh, how God wants to be your father. How he wants to birth you. How he wants to implant his life within you. We gave you three ideas, just roll them by again perpetuating. God is interested in perpetuating himself. And that sounds strange because in the ancient concept, there is the idea, and it's not gone away, it's still here today, but the idea is that a father wants to leave his mark, leave himself, leave something of his own life behind him when he dies. Of course, God isn't going to die because he is eternal, and yet God still has this drive within him to literally bring his life to bear and to express it through others. And the scriptures is very plain on that. Hebrews chapter 2, God wanted to bring many sons into glory. How he wanted to bring many sons. And of course, that's a generic term uh, in which can be translated children, which would include you ladies, of course. So he's not interested in people to serve him, we went through all of that. He's not interested in people to worship him. That's not the intent. He doesn't want your money. Again, we preachers don't want that. It is, see, it isn't in that category. See, what God is after is sons, children, which is, folks, it's all relational. He's not interested in people that act right. He's interested in sons. He isn't interested in people who, all, people who do the right thing. He's interested in sons. He isn't interested in museum pieces. He's interested in sons. Sons is a whole new dynamic. Sons is a whole new category. Who is your father? And of course, if he's going to be perpetuated in your life, he's going to have to produce you, meaning source you. So the whole sourcing issue shows up here. So anything that isn't sourced by him, obviously, is a product of another father. So the whole issue is a source issue. So are you going to have your life literally in, intermingled with his life, which is going to allow him to source your life? And of course, the end result of that is promoting, which was the third idea, which is his image. In other words, through you, you're going to begin to look like him. And that's the way fathering is. See, again, I didn't have any choice on the big nose. Nobody asked me, see? Didn't have any choice on these things. Hey, nobody asked me. They're a product of my fathering, the birthing of my life. So if you're going to be his, you have no choice. Now, you have a choice on whether you're going to be birthed or not, but you don't have any choice whether you're going to look like him. And it's not a, and we're going to get into that tonight, but it's not an issue of, oh, I'm going to try harder kind of stuff. It's a, whoa, look at my face. Can't help it. Not my fault. I'm being birthed. Isn't that a phenomenal concept? That's a parable. That you are sons of the kingdom, birthed by God. Now, tonight, 
we want to talk about the being. There's the birthing, it's the seed concept. And the question is, who is your father? And the second idea that we want to talk about tonight is the being, which is the good seed, uh, it, the good seeds are, are the sons, are the sons. And the question, of course, is, who are you being? Now, the minute I bring up the subject of being, I know about half this crowd says, oh, brother, that again. Because we're always talking about this. This is a constant theme. We have a whole course in the School of Practical Ministry just on this. We teach it every, every semester just on the being, just talking about being. That's how a big a, of a deal this is. In June, every year I can remember for the last 95, is in the, in the June uh, uh, cross-style conference, we have three sessions every morning, and one of them is always on being and doing. This is such a key issue that we just keep talking about it all the time. And here it is, again, staring us right in the face. Why is it such a consistent message? Well, one reason is if you're going to saturate in the Scriptures, it's going to keep showing up. Because the minute you talk about relationship, you are not into doing, you are into being. You, relationship is all about intimacy. Relationship is all about a state of existence. Relationship is all about tightness. Relationship is, oh, there's doing involved and nobody's against doing and we're not mad about doing and it's not doing is bad and, and being is right. It's not that kind of a deal. Being is good, doing is good. There's no way not to do. We're all into doing. Doing is fine. Yay, raw, hallelujah for doing. But the emphasis is on the being. Because if you are doing in order to be, you will never end up being. But if you're being, you will end up doing and can't help yourself. So the issue of the doing being is always the issue of what is producing this thing. And it's out of the state of being that, this, that your Christianity must be produced. And I know you didn't get that, so I'm going to give it to you again. See, if you want to be a Christian and you say, oh, I will do these things in order to be one, you'll never be a Christian. See, if you say you want to be a Christian and you say, oh, the way to be a Christian is to do these things. So I begin to come to church. I begin to look at other Christians and what they do. I see how they wear their hair. I see how they dress. I see what they do. I see how they pray. I see how they bow. I see how they read the Bible. I see how they do. I see they don't do that. They do this. They don't go there. They go here. Okay, so I begin to shape my life like that, and I am doing these things in order to become a Christian, and you will die and go straight to hell because you are never going to be a Christian that way. But, oh, friend, if you would become a Christian, whoo, what you would do, man, wow, what would be produced out of you? Whoo, couldn't keep you from doing. But if you do the doing in order to become the Christian, won't work. But if you become the Christian, and we run into these people who come to church, get involved, become a part of, get intimate with, and, and, and we look at them and we're really excited and say, wow, this is good, this is going to work. They've got it because they shaped their lives and it looks good. But I guarantee you, you will not make it because you can only do Christian things so long until it really becomes a drag, unless you are one. I mean, boring sermons can only be tolerated so long, folks. Amen. You know, you can only put up with that so long. And after a while, you've had it. And pff, I'm gone. I get it. I get it. And the reason for that is because, hey, we were doing in order to be, and it didn't work out. And I guarantee you, you won't stick. You will not stick. You won't stay. It will not, you what? Unless you become one. So it's a state of being. So our emphasis is always, oh, friend, you gotta, you gotta move into this in order to do. Now, we're not against doing. 
doing is good crack it up do more I'm watching I'm keeping track too but it's not about doing it's about being and if you never end up being you will never end up doing enough and staying with it so we're calling you to this being as you look at the world and you might say well why are you consistently why don't you talk about being and then drop the subject the reason is because I have decided we need to talk about being as much as doing has been talked about and when you go to our world doing is always talked about it is the consistent constant emphasis that's bombarding our ears and the emphasis that is pushing us into everything in our lives it's about doing so we are hearing 24 hours a day every voice has a doing emphasis to it therefore in order to combat that we're going to talk about being as much as you've heard about doing and we've got a long ways to go so we could be a long time here you can see that excited you so we are just going and it's not only out there it's in the church world the church world is full of doing how many services you've been in where the whole emphasis of the message was shape up and do right how many how many times have we preached about you should do this prayer Bible reading saturation and the minute you approach that from the doing standpoint it becomes an effort to get something done in order to be something which is backwards in the kingdom so Jesus whole emphasis isn't that exciting Jesus whole emphasis here is hey I want to talk to you about what you're going to be and guess what out of that will spill this what he calls beaming you will shine that's the end of uh, that's verse 43 you will shine forth as the Sun in the kingdom of their father oh, how are you gonna do that or well, you're gonna be wheat <laughs> sons of the kingdom he says phenomenal okay enough of that now all of this being idea is validated in the passage and I want to walk you three through three ideas the first one is the context when you look at the context of the parable and what he's talking about you don't have any choice but to come back to the fact that this is a being idea wheat oh we already gave that away see nowhere in the parables he talk about what the wheat is doing nobody no nowhere in the parable does he talk about how the wheat accomplished nowhere in the parable does he tell how the wheat earned the right to be in the barn there is absolutely no emphasis in the parable in terms of anything that the wheat has produced anything the wheat has accomplished anything that the wheat did anything that was merited anything there is no yay this wheat is better than that wheat look what he did there's none of that at all there are no stars among the wheat they're just all wheat why because they're all the same wheat is wheat and it's a state of being wouldn't that be neat to grasp that in your heart and no there's no competition there's no stars there's no oh you're better than I am you preach longer than I did there's none of that there's just would you just be wheat and we're all gonna be in the barn and shine wouldn't that be something that's his whole concept folks that the wheat has no merit to it at all it's just wheat but you see the same thing is true about the tares they're just poisonous well look how bad they are one's worse than the other no well I'm a bad tear but I'm not as bad as that tear <laughs> no there's none of that tears are tears and they're all poisonous and we're all gonna burn them and it doesn't have all oh, he was a homosexual oh he abused children oh well he only stole five cents oh he robbed a bank see there's none of that tares are just tares why it's who they are 
It's a state of being. Now, you might, if you're thinking, which you probably aren't, but if you're thinking, you could go to verse 41, and uh, is it verse 40? Yeah, it's verse 41, and it says, The Son of Man will send out His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all things that offend. The word offend is the word scandalon, which again is where we get our word scandalous. So they are a scandal. The word actually means, and we've described this before on other studies, but it actually means a stick in a death trap. It's not the wire around the cage. It's not the post that keep the cage. It's not the bait in the cage. It's not the door in the cage. It's the stick that holds the door so the animal, when it comes in to get the bait, wham, knocks the stick over, got him. Got him. It's that stick. That's a state of being. So he says in verse 41, all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness. Well, that's a doing thing. Yeah. They practice lawlessness. You're right. They break the law. Absolutely. So they did the wrong thing. Yeah. No question about it. So the tares do do bad things. Didn't say they didn't. There's nothing wrong with, with a, we're not downplaying doing. We're not belittling doing for the good nor are we undermining doing for the bad. There is a doing that is done. They practice law. But did you know what the word practice is there? This is going to excite you. Poieo. <laughs> oh, my stars. Can you believe that? Poieo, which means what? Trees bearing fruit. In other words, it's a nature thing. So the reason they did this, it spills right out of who they are, which is the nature deal. So they didn't just do that. It isn't they did that and that put them into the fire. They were poisonous now. No, it's that they have this inner condition of poison within which drives them into the breaking of the of being lawless. And their nature, their state of being brings them into that state. So what is his whole emphasis? In the context of everything he's talking about, wheat and tares, he's talking about, hey man, what are you inside? What's your state of being? Who are you being? Who are you being? Are you a Christian? Well, I go to church. Don't say that. We'll wash your mouth out. Because you can go to McDonald's and not be a hamburger. Come on. Context. Second idea in this concept. Where do you see the being concept in the passage validated? One, context. Two, content. Go back to our verse, verse 38. The field is the world. The good seeds are the son, sons of the kingdom. Now, the subject of that sentence is seeds. The good seeds. Seeds are the sons of the kingdom. Seeds are. Seeds is the subject. Good is an adjective describing the seeds. So it's a good seed. That's the subject we're talking about. What is the verb? Are is the verb. It's a little word which is a me. Oh, I forgot to tell you. There's another word that's not even translated, which I thought was really interesting, if you see it in the original language. It literally says in the original language, the good, adjective, seeds, subject, and then it has this word that's not translated, and it's autos, which could be translated, is translated, like these or this. So in the English, that doesn't make any sense to us. See, in the English, if you translated word for word, it would be the good seeds, this are. So we don't say that. It's a double emphasis on the good seeds. Which is an emphasis on the state of being again. So the verb is are. Now the verb, which is translated are, is a me. Oh, my, I can just see you're excited about this. A me is E-I-M-I. And it's the idea, it's the same, and we see it all the time, 
not all the time, but so, uh, often. We see it, for instance, it's the Moses thing in the burning bush, and we say, God, what's your name? Moses says, God, what's your name? And God says, I am, that's the word. He said, a me, a me, that's my name. Double a me. I am that I am. God is not named, I do what I do. God is named, I am what I am, which is the state of being. So evidently, the holy God who is holy in his nature is in, is, has that holiness as a state of his inner being. It's who he is. Now he comes and says, let me talk to you about good seeds are state of being. And then he says, sons of the kingdom, sons. So good seeds are sons. Sons is in the nominative, as seeds are in the nominative, which means subjects. So you got two subjects, you got a double-headed subject. Seed, sons. Oh, in the English we call this a predicate noun or subjective complement, meaning what? You're just restating the subject, which means seeds, good seeds, and sons are the same. You can take out the word are and write equals there, and if it makes sense, you've got it. Good seed equals sons. In fact, you can flip it. Sons of the kingdom equal good seeds. Good seeds equal sons of the kingdom. Why? It's a state of being. So the very content of his statement brings you to this. That we are sons of the kingdom because of who we are, not what we do. Are you a son? Well, I go to church. Don't say that. Well, wash your mouth out. Well, I read my Bible. Don't say that. Been baptized. Don't say that. Because if you do, we'll know you're not. Because that's like putting a tattoo on your forehead saying, not Christian. Well, no, I'm Christian. I go to church. No, see, you don't have the concept. We know you aren't Christian because you're telling me you're a Christian because of what you do. And everybody who knows the Bible knows that you're not Christian because of what you do. You're Christian because of who you are. And oh, you do all these things because of who you are. So if you decide, I want to be a Christian, well, how are you going to do that? Well, I'll do all of these things and try to shape your life like a Christian. You will never be one, people. Right. So what, I, what, what you need to do is, oh, become a Christian, and then, hey, you'll take shape. It'll work out. It'll happen. Wow. Are you a son? Jesus. I spend my whole life trying to do the right thing. Yeah. I spend all this energy trying to quit that habit and stop doing that and don't say that anymore and learning to count to ten and control my anger and get my tongue under control, and I spend my whole life, God, just trying to discipline my life and so I can do the right thing and look like a Christian. Spent my whole life, God, just studying the Scriptures and I want to be like you and trying to be like you. I wear sandals and have long hair. And... And wouldn't it be awful if all this time I've missed it? And what you wanted was not somebody running around doing all this stuff. What you wanted was a son. You wanted to birth me and bring me into the intimacy of your presence. And so fill me with your nature that out of me would begin to spill all this stuff that I just couldn't help but do. So God, maybe this is not about figuring out what I ought to do. Maybe this is about I need to embrace you tighter. Amen. 
I need your presence more. I want to know you in greater intimacy. Maybe what I ought to spend my whole life on is not getting my act together. Maybe what I need to do is not getting my acts together. Maybe what I need to do is just go after you. Could you give me one focus, one drive, one passion, one thing I want more than anything else, one thumb in my back, one burn in my bones for you and more of you. And everything else would take care of itself. God, would you make us a church like that? Number one, would you make us a church that doesn't do programs, but is just filled with you and just can't help but do stuff? That doesn't have to stand up before people and beg them? That doesn't have to make them feel guilty in order to get them to do something? We don't have to institute a program and then crack the whip so that the program operates properly? Would you make us a church of people who are just so filled with you and intimate with you that out of us there just spills this stuff? These actions, these... who you are. Would you make us individuals like that? Hands are bowed. Would you just walk through your life and see everything in your life you're trying to make happen? Good desires and how you are desperate to pull it off and make it happen. And would you just change your focus tonight from making it happen to going after him and see what he does to it? And again, let me, let me say to you, if you've discovered all of these things that a Christian is, here's what a Christian looks like, and you try to act that way and shape your life in that manner in order to be one, you'll never be Christian. You'll get discouraged. You'll quit. You won't be able to endure the long sermons. But would you just fall in love with Jesus? Would you just be his? And see what he does through you? Moments of seeking. Want to join me in prayer at the altar?